Father in heaven, you are gracious to us. You're gracious to us to give us this day, the the Lord's day, to celebrate the day that you rose from the dead. And and though we do that every Sunday, um, we're grateful that today we can gaze right into the center of it, that we can look at the heart of our faith and the cross and resurrection of Jesus, that we can look into that thing that has changed so many for millennia. And Father, we know that, that unless your spirit does a work to impart these things to our heart, it won't change us. This can be routine, this can be rote, this can be the same thing we do every year if your spirit doesn't work. And so we just pray that you would be gracious again to us today and that you would apply the words of truth in your scripture to our hearts so that we would believe. I pray for those who don't believe at all here today that you would give them a real sense of your presence and your drawing of them to yourself that they might believe and be forgiven. And I pray for those who've been walking with you for a long time, who are tired, who are weary, we're doubting. I pray that today the message of the resurrection would go to our hearts and change us again. We need you here this morning, and so we pray that you would work and be gracious again to meet with us in your word. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on Good Friday, Rome did to Jesus what they'd done to any number of would-be messiahs over the years. So far, really, the story wasn't all that much different from the outside than what had happened with a lot of people who claimed to be Messiah. They claimed to be the king. They claimed to be the Messiah. They had a lot of people who followed them, and then Rome got intimidated and put them to death. And that had happened over and over again, and the followers of all of those little lowercase m messiahs all ended up scattering afterwards. Many times their followers were put to death, and the whole thing was over. And so on Saturday, it seemed like the Jesus movement was over as well. I'm sure his followers were terrified. They were looking around thinking, man, if they put Jesus to death, then certainly they will to us too. And so they were hiding. They felt like the whole rug had been pulled out from under them. Just a few days before Jesus rode in on a donkey, they thought that he was there to conquer. They thought that he was there to win, to be the king, to kick out the oppressors. And none of that panned out because now he has died and he's been buried in Joseph's tomb. Now these people had probably had relatives who had warned them years ago about this. Don't follow a Messiah. Don't do that. It's going to cost you everything. It's going to cost you your life. Don't put all of your chips in on this guy. He's just a cult leader. He's making these really big claims, but anyone can claim to be God. Anyone can claim to forgive sins. Anyone can conjure up a few illusions to make you believe that he's a miracle worker. Don't do it. Don't believe. And they told their their relatives, no, this is different. We know that this guy's different. This time around, this one has the words of truth, the words of life. He speaks, and he speaks like nobody else. But now he's dead in the grave. And his relatives are saying, you see, we were right. And they're all saying, maybe, maybe you were. But something happened. And as the Apostles' Creed says, on the third day, he rose again from the dead. And the resurrection of Jesus from the dead caused that movement of Jesus not to die, but actually to get larger and stronger, more joy-filled than ever in a burgeoning community of his followers. That whole Jesus movement didn't die with Jesus because Jesus ended up triumphing over death. And for 2,000 years, Christians have been singing songs, looking back and celebrating that day, not just as a day where a great martyr died, not just as a day when someone loved us enough to, to give his life for us, though that's all true, but they looked back and celebrated that day as a day when Jesus Christ conquered death and rose again from the grave. They used to sing the words of 1 Corinthians 15, 55, where it says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And for hundreds of years, Christians would sing that as a way of spiking the ball in the end zone and rubbing that victory in the face of death. That, yeah, it's true that anyone can talk a good game, anyone can claim to be God, but you have to be God to conquer death. And Jesus did. So we celebrate him and we worship him as God. And what happened on that first Easter morning and the the days to follow set in motion the biggest world-changing movement in human history. And today in worshiping him and praising him and coming to belief in him, we are joining in that movement today. We're celebrating the fact that he did die on the cross, but then that on the third day, he rose from the dead. And it's important that we realize this wasn't just a spiritual resurrection. This wasn't just that he was resurrected in our hearts. It wasn't just a metaphorical resurrection where we say, yeah, he died, but he still kind of lives with us in spirit. 
he really body, bodily, physically rose from the dead. And he didn't just conquer death in our sentiments and feelings, he conquered death in the real world, in his real body. After descending to the dead, he got up from that tomb. And I hope that the one thing that we take away from all this this morning is that we believe that. That we believe that on the third day he rose again. Because it was that resurrection of Jesus that caused faith to be born in those first followers of Jesus who had their hopes dashed on Saturday. And by reading their stories and hearing the account and seeing the faith that it created in them, we can have the same faith created in us. And so if you're here as a Christian who's been in church forever and you feel like you've believed forever, I hope the reminder of the resurrection is enough to refresh your faith so that you'll repent again and live like it's real. Because if the resurrection is real, and it is, it's the most important truth in the universe. And it's completely worth giving every bit of our lives to. And if you're here today and you don't believe, I hope that as we read these accounts, you'll say that I believe this is true, that it resonates as true with you, that God draws you in to this resurrection life of Jesus Christ. And so in Matthew 28, verse 1, it's describing the the Easter narrative. And it says, now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. So these two women are going into the tomb early Sunday morning. This was the normal practice for the women to go to the tomb and to mourn and to wail out loud. So they expected to go and kind of wear themselves out with weeping that day. They expected to invite their friends and weep and mourn with them. But then something happened. Verse 2, it says, And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I've told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and go to Galilee, that there they will see me. So when the women got to the tomb, they saw that the stone was rolled away. They saw that the angel, whose appearance was like lightning, was there. And the angel says to them, he's risen. He's not here. He, he rose just like he said he would. So go and tell everybody else. And so, so they ran away, and, and the story continues. And Matthew's account here was a very early account. This this gospel was already being cited by other authors by 95 AD. It was written as the eyewitness testimony to these things. It wasn't written hundreds of years later as a testimony to what was really just a myth. This was written down right away as an historical account and not as an attempt to create a story. Not as an attempt to create a story that's believable so some people would give their lives to it. In fact, we know that because in their day, because of rampant sexism, the testimony of women wasn't always considered to be reliable in most circles. So if you were trying to make up a story about Jesus rising from the dead in their day, you would try to make it sound like there were reliable witnesses there. And in the minds of many chauvinistic people in their day, there weren't reliable witnesses because there were women there. But this story isn't written like a fabrication in a legend. It's written as it actually happened. It's not written to people's standards for what makes reliable witnesses, but it's written to God's standards, and God said, these women are reliable witnesses. And so he appeared to them first. And the reason they wrote it down that way is because that's what really happened. It wasn't because they were trying to make up a story that was believable, because they could have done better at making a more believable story in their day. Now we read this and we say, but, but is it believable? Because this kind of thing just doesn't happen. Like people don't rise from the dead. Nobody on their own power had ever come back from the dead before this, and nobody on their own power has ever come back from the dead after this. And so as Christians, we affirm something that doesn't happen. We affirm that Jesus rose, which means that we believe that there's more to the universe than meets the eye. 
We believe that there's a God over all of it, who made all of it, who set the laws of the universe in motion, and normally they work the way that they work. Normally people don't rise from the dead, but occasionally God intervenes and pushes aside those laws of the universe to do something that never happens, and here he did in raising Jesus Christ from the dead. We believe that Jesus bodily rose. You see him in the stories after the resurrection, going and eating a fish dinner with his disciples. And, and we hear that story today in a story that's that outlandish. Not just that he spiritually rose, not that he just rose in our hearts, but to, that he actually got up from the grave. That can create some doubts in our heart. But there's no denying that somewhere around 33 AD, a group of people suddenly completely changed their view of the world. They changed their view of God. They changed their, their plans for their future, their lives and everything that they wanted to do with them. It was all radically altered. And the strongest piece of evidence that there is that the resurrection actually happened was that that early Christian church formed. And it formed really quickly out of many people from many different backgrounds, many different age groups. They completely changed their view of God and the world to accept it. And that kind of thing just doesn't happen. I mean, once we're adults, we usually don't make radical changes in our personalities. We, we grow and we change throughout our lives for sure, but usually our personalities and our preferences and our habits are pretty firmly set by the time we're in our mid to late 20s. In fact, it's a pretty safe bet that the kind of music that you like to listen to now is the kind that you started liking in your teens and 20s, and in your mind, it's been all downhill since then. Um, that they, they just haven't made good stuff since then. That was the peak because we get all those preferences kind of set in our minds. You almost never hear a story of someone saying, yeah, my grandmother, she just really loved classical music her whole life, and then when she was 80, she really got into Metallica. Like, it was just like, you don't have that kind of sudden change in your personality without some radical explanation. We tend to find our ruts in our 20s, and we stay there. And it takes a really radical event to, to jolt us out of those ruts and change us. But all of a sudden, around 33 AD, a group of men and women in Jerusalem from all ages changed dramatically. All around the same time. History and the Bible are loaded with story after story of people who had no room in their worldview or in their religion for God becoming a man for any of this Christian stuff. It just didn't fit in the way that they thought about theology, the way they thought about the world. But all of a sudden, a whole ton of them started to say that they believed it. In his book, The Reason for God, Tim Keller points out that the first followers of Jesus were, were mainly Jewish, and Jews would never dream of a scenario where God would become a man. It was almost blasphemous in their minds. But all of a sudden, around 33 AD, hundreds of Jews claimed to be eyewitnesses of Jesus after his resurrection. People who believed that God would never become a man suddenly started saying that he did because they saw him when he had risen. You saw people who were totally opposed to Jesus, who totally hated his followers, all of a sudden worshiping him as God. That radical change has to be explained by something. So what's our explanation for that? I mean, people have come up with all kinds of different explanations for what really happened to try to explain away the resurrection. Uh, there's an increasingly popular movement lately where they say that the, begin the origin story of, of really all the world religions is that people used hallucinogenic drugs. And then when, once they hallucinated, they told their stories of God and a lot of people believed them. And it's true. I mean, if one person were claiming that someone had risen from the dead, you could certainly chalk that whole thing up to magic mushrooms. Like you could say, yeah, that person's hallucinating, that person's on something, but hundreds of people were coming to faith in him, all saying that they saw Jesus resurrected from the dead. One person can hallucinate, but hundreds of people wouldn't all hallucinate at the exact same time. Now, some of you might say, well, well that's not true. I was at Woodstock, and <laughs> hundreds of people certainly can hallucinate all at the same time, but they were having different hallucinations. These people were all saying, we saw Jesus risen from the dead. People believed because either they saw Jesus after he rose or people that they knew were reliable and wouldn't make stuff like this up were all saying that they saw Jesus rise from the dead. And you have to explain that somehow. People don't change their mind on something that's that big of a deal overnight. Something happened. And if the resurrection didn't happen, 
we have to come up with some other explanation for the explosion of Christianity in those early years. Now, some people would say that it was just a lie. It was just a story that spun out of control. A couple of disciples felt really dumb for following him, so they decided to tell everybody that Jesus rose from the dead just to save face a little bit. But the thing is, we know that they really believed it because so many of them were tortured and killed for their faith. They wouldn't back away from their story. Blaise Pascal said, I believe those witnesses that get their throats cut. They can make up a story and it could benefit them for a while, but when they have to stand before trial and they know that they're going to face death if they stick with this story, at that moment, they're going to give up the fiction because they want to live. But they didn't. If they'd made up the story to try to gain fame or influence or money, then, then they would have renounced the story when it was time to die. But again and again, they stood before those trials and they refused to renounce the story. That's because it was true. The story that Jesus rose was true. Now, some people said, well, maybe the authorities came and stole his body because they didn't want that tomb to become a shrine. They saw this Jesus movement getting a little out of control, and all of a sudden, if they've now made Jesus a martyr, everybody's going to gather around that shrine, and it's going to be trouble. There's going to be political trouble, so let's get rid of the body, and that way we don't have this becoming the the place where everybody comes, and it's like the flashpoint for mob violence. But they knew right away that that plan would have backfired, because Christianity exploded instantly. People were saying that they saw him risen from the dead. And so if they had a body, they would have produced it at that point to to quell all of that. But they weren't able to do so. Some have said, well, maybe they misplaced the body. That Jesus was buried in one tomb, and then they kind of got directions wrong. And on Easter Sunday morning, they went to the wrong tomb, and it was empty. And so, oops, we just started the biggest religion in the world because we, we got directions wrong in the graveyard. But the thing is, it wasn't just the empty tomb that caused people to believe. If it was just the empty tomb, they would have come up with a number of explanations besides that he rose from the dead before they ever would have believed that he was walking around risen from the dead. It was the fact that they actually saw him and spoke with him after the resurrection that caused them to believe. Not just the empty tomb by itself. At my house, I lose my keys like all the time. And my first explanation is not, well, those keys came to life and they walked off somewhere. Like, I come up with more plausible explanations like you do. I blame my wife and my kids. Like, I say that these people moved them. Like, there's some other thing that I should believe before I believe that my keys are alive. But these people said, yeah, we could come up with some explanations for that tomb being empty that aren't, that don't involve a resurrection until we see the resurrected Jesus. Until he starts speaking with us until we sit and we eat with him, and we put our fingers in his side, and we realize that the reason that he's not in that tomb is because he's risen. Now, some have also said that maybe Jesus never really died. Maybe, maybe the cross just kind of knocked him out, got him close to death, then they put him in that cold tomb, and there he woke up and, and, and pushed the stone away and got out. But the Romans knew what death was. The gospel testimony is that a spear was stuck in his side and that the blood and water drained out. And even if he had survived all that and then they put him in the tomb, certainly he wouldn't have had the strength to roll away the stone and get out of the tomb. Jesus really did die on that cross and he really did resurrect. So if he didn't rise from the dead, what what is the explanation? What's the explanation for this joyful, courageous faith that all of these people seem to have out of the blue? The people who knew him best, the people who lived through all of this, said that they saw him, they spoke with him, and he's alive. All of the evidence points to the fact that Jesus Christ rose. And if this is true, and it definitely is, then this is the best news that we've ever heard. Think of what this really means for us. If Jesus really rose from the grave, then that means that we are really loved by God and can be accepted by God. That we don't have to try to earn his favor through our religious observance. We don't have to try to be good enough to get to God. We don't have to guess. We can embrace what Jesus did for us on that cross by faith. We can hang our hopes and our trust in him. 
and know that he paid the price for our sins so that we can have everlasting life and we've been loved and accepted by our Father. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 5 again. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So that means that Jesus died for our sin, and it takes care of our sin and our guilt. This is great news because it means that our guilt can be remedied. And we all know what our conscience is telling us. Our, our conscience is telling us that we're guilty. It tells us what the Bible tells us, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so what we're tempted to do with that is to numb ourselves to that, not pay any attention to that, to live like that's not true, to live like that's just a vestige of something old and not pay attention to the condemnation of our conscience. Or on the other hand, we can, we can just completely ignore what it says all day long. It can cry out to us, and we can just push it off to the side and, and know that it's true, but try to ignore it with our lives. But we don't have to do either one of those because Jesus died for our sins. Jesus paid the price for our sin. We can have our conscience cleansed by the sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus for us. The resurrection of Jesus is also really good news because it means that death doesn't have the final say. Funerals really changed once Jesus resurrected. You go to a Christian funeral and it's a different experience. There, there should be mourning there and there should be a sense of loss. And there's certainly weeping as someone that we love has gone on before us. But also a Christian funeral is laced with hope. It's laced with a little bit of joy. And the reason for that is because Romans 6.5 says, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. The hope that we have as Christians is that we were united to Jesus in his death. The death that he died on that cross was our death. And our hope, our future, is all tied up in the future resurrection that we have with him. That just like he really physically rose from the grave, we really will too. We're followers of Jesus who follow in his footsteps. And yes, we will die, but we'll rise too because of the resurrection of Jesus. Death doesn't have the final say over us. So because of Easter, because of the cross and resurrection of Jesus, our conscience can be cleansed, our guilt can be lifted. We can know that death doesn't have the final say. And we can also know that we have a God who is powerful enough to work absolutely everything for our final good and for his final glory. Listen to Romans 8, verse 34. It says, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? He's saying, look what Jesus did. He went to the cross and he, he, was, he died for us. He was buried and he rose again. And now he's seated at the right hand of God, praying for us. And if the one who's powerful enough to conquer death is interceding for us today, how much does that change the way we live? How much does it impart confidence to us? He goes on, he says, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So the resurrection gives us confidence to live like that's true. So the invitation to all of us today is to believe the gospel either to believe it for the first time or to, to believe it so that we live like it's true as we go out from here. 
And so if you're here and, and you're not yet a believer in Christ, I want you to know that the big invitation to you is that you can believe this and be forgiven. You can believe this and be united to him. You can believe this and have all of that hope imparted to your life. And the message of this gospel is the message that we were alienated from God by our sins. We'd all sinned. We'd all fallen short of his glory. We were separated from him. That, that rope that connected us to our creator was cut. But Jesus came and he died in our place, just like the scripture said that he would. He really died on the cross, and then he really rose on the third day. And then that was confirmed by many witnesses. And the invitation to us is that if we will repent, if we'll turn from whatever was ultimate to us before, whatever was driving us before, if we'll turn, whether it's from our, our sins that we've been living in or our unbelief or even the really good things that we had put in the place of God in our lives, if we would turn from those things and turn to him and believe in him and what he did for us on that cross and trust in him, hang all of our hopes in the redemption that he accomplished for us on that cross, then we're forgiven. You can cry out to God from, from your seat in whatever words you want and ask for that forgiveness and salvation. And he promises that of all who come to him on his term, he won't cast anyone away. So the message today is not that you can go out from here and be really good to try to become a Christian. The message is that you can become one in your seat by receiving by faith the thing that Jesus did for you. And that'll have all kinds of implications for how you live your life. It'll, it'll change everything as you go out from here. But we don't become Christians by the things we do. We become Christians by receiving what he did for us in his death and his resurrection. But Christians, if the resurrection is true, then we're called to go all in on Jesus. Those disciples who probably thought they had wasted their lives on Saturday when Jesus was dead would have had to radically change their minds about that once they saw the risen Jesus. All of a sudden, that bet was a good one. And for us as Christians, believing that Jesus rose from the dead, that means that everything he said must be true because I believe the guy who can conquer death. That looks awesome on your resume. That gives you real authority. It means that when you say things about God, you can be believed because you rose. So as Christians, we should go all in on obedience to Jesus, on trustingly waiting for Jesus. By conquering death, Jesus showed that he can keep every single one of his promises and that he does. And he's promised us that one day he's going to return and make all things new. And so rather than being frenzied and anxious all the time, rather than reading the news or looking at the world around us and feeling like everything is falling apart, we can look at all of that and say, but I trust Jesus. I trust in the one who conquered the grave. And when he said he's coming back, he's faithful to keep that promise, so I trust him. And as Christians, we can wrap all of our hopes for the future up in Jesus. There are a lot of good things that, that we hope for. A lot of good things we want to have in our futures, and, and those aren't all things that we have to dismiss. But ultimately, our biggest hope is that one day we'll see him face to face. And if we live like that's true, that shapes all of the other hopes. It shapes all of the other priorities. And certainly we all fall short of living like that resurrection is a reality every single day. But even as we do, we know that we have a God who has promised that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can live with resurrection hope that changes everything. And for now, let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Thank you that he came as the only solution to our biggest problem. Thank you for the gift that is Calvary and that is the empty tomb. As we look at that, though, we, we confess that we keep looking for another solution, like there's more. You see it in our lack of trust. You see it in our, our frenzied sense that, that we have to fix everything. 
You see it in so much of our faithlessness and our sin. So Father, forgive us for not living like the resurrection is true. And Jesus, we thank you that you were faithful for us. Thank you that you went to the cross to pay the price for all of our sins, all of our failures, all of our faithlessness. Thank you that after you died, you pronounced that all of that was finished. And thank you that you rose again to prove that all of that was true. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would work these truths into our hearts so that we believe them. So that we stop looking for something better than Jesus. So that we stop thinking we can come up with a better way than obedience to Jesus. Work the truth of, of the cross into the very center of our vision of you. So that when you command us toward any kind of obedience, we can't for a second believe that we could come up with something better than following the way of, of a God who loves us so much. We do believe that Jesus rose. And we pray that you would help our unbelief, forgive us of our sins, and refresh our hope. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Well, as we've con confessed our sin to him and we trust in him, listen to this assurance from Scripture. This is Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. It says, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life.